So we're going to Romans chapter 13 tonight. This is session 11. This first hour will be on that we are to be subject to governing authorities. We're going to go to Romans chapter 13. We've been in chapter 12 for the first 10 sessions. And um, a lot of what we've read about um, in these sessions is really on, on how to, when we transform our life, we've really been dealing with a lot of how to deal with other people. A lot of what's written in 12 is how we are to conduct our lives in light of other people. Like we looked at, um, we're to be devoted to one another in love. We're to give preference to others in honor. Uh, we're to contribute to the need of the saints. We're to practice hospitality. We are to bless those who curse you. We are not to pay back evil for evil. We are to live at peace with all men, and we are to, to overcome evil with good. All of these are, you know, it's not dealing with myself, it's dealing with other people. A lot of when, when we transform and we go out into the world, it's how do we deal with others? And here in Romans 13, we're going to look at how do we deal with those who rule over us, with those who have authority over our lives in government. Quite an interest, quite a topic. Um, so what I thought what I'd first do is um, just like to read, I'm going to cover the first six verses, and I'd just like to read through it all with you. Um, in Romans 13, I have it up here, but also you can follow in your Bible. Romans 13, verse 1. It says, every person is to be subjection to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those who exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good, but if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. So now we'll look at these verses in more detail. First of all, Romans 13, 1, it says, Every person is to be in subjection to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. I always thought this was an amazing thing when I, when I really came to, to look at this and consider it um, throughout Scripture. Um, and the thing that to me is pretty clear in the Old Testament is that God is sovereign over all the nations of the world. God is in control. And these are just a few examples in Scripture. I have them up here of where God exercise his authority and his sovereignty over kings and over nations. I think one of the earliest is in Genesis 14, and that's the record of uh, where uh, the kings of the east under King Chedorlaomer and the kings of the east battled, and they took Sot, and they took him away. And then Abraham went out and defeated these kings. He beat them. And what, uh, and actually I think it's what, uh, 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 Melchizedek said, you know, that God has delivered them into your hands. And Abraham said, you know, he, he wouldn't take money. He said, for I, I lifted my hand up to God. And God delivered him from those kings and took them out. And it says in uh, Hebrews, he slaughtered them. He slaughtered those kings. So there God, I think, intervened in government. He intervened in the direction of nations. Of course, Genesis 40 and 41 is the record in, it ends out Genesis with the man Joseph who went into Egypt, right? He was sold into slavery into Egypt. 
And uh, Pharaoh had a dream, and Joseph interpreted the dreams, and Joseph rose up in power in Egypt, and there were seven years of famine and seven years of plenty, and God showed Pharaoh through Joseph what God was doing to brought Egypt into great power under the man Joseph. It also brought Joseph into great power. So God intervened there. It's clear he did that. Of course, Exodus chapter 5 through 11 is God delivering the children of Israel from Egypt, right? He sent all these plagues on that nation. Eventually, he destroyed their army in the uh, Red Sea, devastated their crops, their livestock, all the, the plagues that came on the land, and then destroyed their army, the host, in the Red Sea. Um, I'd say God intervened into government. He intervened into history and into that kingdom. Um, the book of Joshua, they, they went into the plan. The, the Joshua was, was divided up amongst all these kings and these nations in this land of Canaan. And under Joshua, they defeated seven nations. And they became a theocracy under judges. A government was established by God, taking out seven other nations in the book of uh, Joshua. And in the book of Numbers, of course, God raises up judges, and you'll see where, where all these nations come in, uh, God raises up a, a deliverer, then they fall out, and then another nation comes in, and it was back and forth, back and forth, and, and God was very active and involved in the judges that rose up in those uh, different governments. Of course, you have uh, the records of Samuel and Kings where the people said, we want a king. God gave them a king, and they became the kingdom of Israel. And then, of course, when uh, uh, after Solomon and, and Rehoboam, uh, the top ten kingdoms became another nation called Israel, and you had the southern kingdom of Judah. God did that, all right? God organized that, and um, that God brought about those nations. The book of Jonah is an incredible one where this city, this government of Nineveh, the whole city, 120,000 people, it says, we're going we're gonna to perish. And God told Jonah, go, go tell those people, go preach. Jonah didn't want to. Finally, he did. He preached. And the people repented. These people repented, and God saved Nineveh. Now, Nineveh became one of the capital cities of the kingdom of Assyria. That wasn't a small thing. So God definitely intervened and showed his sovereignty on this kingdom, this city of Nineveh. In um, Isaiah 10, 5, God calls the king of Assyria, which was one of the great empires of the, of the old times, he calls him his rod of his anger to bring out his anger upon the nation of Israel. God called Assyria his rod. In Jeremiah 27, 6, God calls King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, his servant. That Nebuchadnezzar was God's servant to bring judgment on Judah. So God was involved. Daniel 5, 25, uh, 25 through 28, that's that great record where Belshazzar's having that feast and that wall, hand comes along <laughs> on the wall, and nobody can read it. They bring in Daniel, and Daniel says, I can read it, King. Keep your gifts. I'll read it for you. And he says, uh, and basically, uh, your kingdom has been numbered, and you're found wanting, and I'm giving it over to the Medes and the Persians. And that night, uh, Babylon was taken over, and the Medes and the Persians took over. I'd say God was involved. God was definitely involved. And then in Isaiah 45, 1 and Ezra 1, God calls Cyrus, the king of Persia, his anointed to subdue other nations. So throughout history, these are just some, these are things that were off the top of my head. I bet I could find more if I looked more through the Bible, that God is sovereign. God shows his sovereignty over kingdoms. Look at some of these verses. This is in Daniel 4. This is what Nebuchadnezzar, remember the time when Nebuchadnezzar went out and he lived for seven years like an animal? And then he came to his senses and he came to realize, and this is what Nebuchadnezzar came to realize. And in Daniel 4, 17, it says, in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler 
over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. That is what Nebuchadnezzar talked about God and who he is. God is sovereign. He is ruler over the realm of mankind. Um, and then remember uh, Jesus? Uh, he comes to, uh, um, he's before Pilate. And do I have that? Yeah, and Pilate says to him, and John, that's up here in the chart, Pilate says to uh, Jesus, so Pilate said to him, do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? And what was Jesus' answer? Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. Whew. This is what Jesus said to Pilate, who crucified him. Um, I think God has a little ability over the nations of mankind. One of my favorite records, you can actually turn, I have it written up here, but if you want to turn, I'm going to turn there to Jeremiah chapter 18. I, I love this um, record here in Jeremiah regarding this topic. In Jeremiah 18, verse 1, It says, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, from Yahweh, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house. And there he was, making something on the wheel. Have you guys ever seen a pottery wheel? I always wanted to have a pottery wheel. I never did, but you know, you ever, you ever seen, and you, know, you make the clay, and you can, have you guys ever used pottery? Anybody ever done a pottery wheel? It looks cool. I never did it, but I always wanted to. You'll make a little pot. But, you know, they, they get that wheel spinning. They take that lump of clay. And, and, and so Jeremiah goes down, and he's watching this guy make a pot, right? He's on the pottery wheel, forming it with his hands. And I watched this, and verse 4, but the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter to make. So he's watching this guy with the pottery, and it's, he forms it into this nice little vase. He's like, ah, pfft, I don't like that. And he starts over again, and he makes another pot. A different shape, right? Different, I, mean, I think I'll put some, you know, he changes it the way he wants it, right? Great, this is what God tells Jeremiah, go watch this guy make pottery. So Jeremiah goes, he watches him make pottery. Verse 5, then the word of the Lord, Yahweh, came to me saying, can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you? As this potter does, declares Yahweh. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At what moment I might speak concerning a nation or a kingdom to uproot and to pull down or to destroy it? If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring on it, like he did with Nineveh. Or if another nation, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning the kingdom to build it up and to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good which I had promised to bless it. God says, you know, the nations, they're like, the, I'm like the pot, they're the clay. I can do whatever I want to do with the nations. God is sovereign. Now, there are different opinions about this, and I'm not smart enough to know this. There's some people who think that God controls everything, that, every, that everybody, it's like God has a little, you know, he's got like a little chess game or like, you know, like a little board of stratego, and he's, you know, he's playing both sides of it and making things and, and designing everything. He's got everything from the get-go, and he's got it all planned, and, you know, oh, I think I'll have this. You know, you ever do that, play with a little army men? <laughs> One beat, and, and, you know, the, he does that with mankind, and, you know, like God's in... And then you go to the other street where people don't think God has any involvement. And, uh, um, and then there's those who think, well, God allows governments to rise up. And, you know, they can keep going and, and he'll let it happen. And if he decides to intervene, he intervenes. And if he doesn't, he doesn't. And you know what? I don't know. I'm not God. And I've come to the conclusion that I'm not smart enough to figure out God. One thing I knew to know about God is it says he's wise. And it says that the wisdom of God is smarter, is the foolishness of God is smarter than the wisdom of men. So 
God's got it figured out. I don't know how he does this. It's not my job to try and define how God does things. We just read what it says. God over authority. God is sovereign. And he's in control. So therefore, <laughs> look what it says for us. In Romans 13, 2, it says, Therefore, since we know that God is in charge, God is under all governments under his authority, therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. We're back in Romans 13, by the way. I have it on the chart here, but I should tell you we're there. Romans 13, verse 3, he says, For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have the praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. But it, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on one who practices evil. I don't know why in this verse the NASB used the pronoun it. King James, ESV, all the other, almost every other version I've read uses the pronoun he rather than it. I wonder if it was that neuter thing. They didn't want to offend women, so they used, I don't know, you know why, they, why NASB used the pronoun it here. I think, I think he is a good pronoun for, you know, talking about the one who's an authority. It could be a she, too, right? You know, if, if the authority is a woman that's in charge, it would be a she. So, so it's just the word it. I don't know. But anyways, um, we are to be under authority. Uh, these are verses I have. We don't need to turn there because I have them up here. But uh, this, this is reiterated in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. And this, boy, I, I used to wonder about the Romans 13, but then when I read this in Peter, it's like, eh, you know, I think they're saying the same thing. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king, as the one in authority, or to governors, as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right, by doing right with authority, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, Fear God, honor the king. It's pretty straightforward on the way we are supposed to be with government. Also in Titus 3.1, on, up here on the chart, it says, Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to obey, to be ready for every good deed. So, here at our church, the Living Hope, we have actually come to learn this um, during this COVID pandemic. It is really, for me, probably of, the, of all my time working in ministry time, it has become uh, these verses, I think as much as anything, have directed my heart in what we need to do as a church. But it's been really tough. Um, but I know what the scripture says. It says I'm supposed to be obedient. But it's been a challenge in our times um, during this. Um, but ultimately, our direction comes from Jesus Christ. And what is directed, that he directed his apostle Peter and his apostle Paul to write. The difficulty for us, I think, has been coming to understand is what are the rules? Tell me what the rule is so we can be obedient. And it's really been the difficult, especially when you're dealing with state governments that all have different rules and you have a federal government that has a federal guideline. I mean, we were, we were 
there was a time where they said we could only have 10 people. So we tried to do that. You know, we only had, you know, but with the praise team and the people in the back that were webcasting, we only had 10 people. And then we were waiting for us to come out of this, right? We went through phase one, okay? Phase two, phase three. It was like, well, well they weren't giving any direction to churches. There was no direction of what we were supposed to do. And so we're like, well, what do we do? And, uh, and then the, the federal government came down and said, churches are essential businesses. So we're like, okay, well, if we're essential, then we're going to open, right? We're going to open, we're going to distance. And then the governor said, no, churches have to maintain the 10 people. And they're like, well, you know what? The federal government supersedes the state government. So we're like, well, we'll go with the federal government. Well, the, the state of California challenged the state government on this ruling, and the Supreme Court upheld the government, not the church. And so we're like, ah! <laughs> just tell us the rule, right? Tell us the rule. And I'll be, I'll be honest with you, for myself, because look it, I know, and, and uh, I'll talk about this in a minute, but I'm obedient to God. And if, if the government rules, um, if a government ruling and a government obe- uh, uh, ordinance contradicts what God tells me to do, I have to go with what God tells me to do, even if it's against government. Well, we were told in the last chapter, right, we're supposed to be given the hospitality. And I don't care who you are or what you think, a Zoom meeting is not the same as hospitality, right? To try and, and, to try and be hospitable and to live the way we were directed in chapter 12 cannot be done strictly through Zoom meetings, And so we were coming to a conclusion where we might have to, you know, buck the government, right? And then just like overnight, what change? You're going to have 25%. Well, 25% in our church is, we can hold 250 in this room. So we're like, well, we can do that, right? And so we opened up. And then we figured out how to do this with, um, how how to do the thing with the mask and the social distancing. We were able to do Kingdom Fest. That we, there is a way that I can carry out what Jesus said, and obey the government. And I don't have to compromise God's word. And it's, it's, been, it was, it's been a real challenge for us, but I've been very blessed with what we've been able to do and to continue on to carry out what God said. I mean, I was already, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I told Sean and Tom this, but I was ready to say, look it, let's go home fellowships. Let's go strictly home fellowships. We, we, we don't need a church building. We used to do home fellowships all the time. You can fit 10 people. So we'll have 20 churches with 10 people in them. Or you know what else we thought about doing? We thought about doing a fellowship here every night, maybe three times a day. Fellowship at this time of day, fellowship at this time of day, fellowship at this time of day, have 10 people come, 10 people come, 10 people. You can do it. We're like, we can figure this out and still obey the government and follow the rules, follow what our Lord said we're supposed to do. And I think that's the way we're supposed to live. We're not supposed to try and block the government um, because we don't like it. Well, let, wait a minute. Pray about it. Can we do this where we can follow Jesus Christ and follow what he said that we're supposed to be under authority? And to the best of our ability, we've tried to continue to do this. And we're going to continue to do this. And this thing's got to get over with. Well, that's another thing. Anyways, <laughs> so it's been quite a challenge for us But these verses really were the direction in my heart of why the way we've conducted ourselves, even more than the health things. Uh, To me, because you know what? Uh, Well, direction in Scripture here is general. It's not specific to any one government, any one type of government. It doesn't say you'll be obedient if you're in a democratic government, but if you are in a You know, an authoritarian government, don't be obedient. Or if you're in a socialist government, don't be obedient. Or if you are under a king, don't be obedient. But if you're in a democracy, be obedient. There's nothing about that in here. There's nothing about the type of government. And it's also not specific to any ordinance or law, right? There's nothing in the Bible about mask wearing, social distancing, wearing a seatbelt. Not in the Bible, right? So, uh, now... Also, think about this. Probably within 10 years of what was written to the church in Rome here, Emperor Nero declared Christianity illegal and began the persecution against the church. To the Romans! That's who Paul's writing to. 
Nero is just about ready to be the emperor. Woo! Think about that for a minute. So um, I'm blessed. I think we are blessed to be in a country that we're in. I mean, I'm sure Timmy Paul could tell you about the Congo and the government of the Congo. And, and Ed, Edwin, I don't know if you're watching tonight, but I mean, I, I pray for Edwin. Edwin's in Saudi Arabia. I mean, I can't even, I don't know. God needs to direct you how to live within your government and how to carry out what Jesus said. And to me, what I love about it is it puts my dependence on God. It puts my dependence on Jesus Christ to direct me on what he wants me to do in my situation. To be obedient. And it's great. It's good. It's good for us to challenge ourselves to how do we live in this world to carry out what our Lord said. So um, there are times in scriptures when believers did not submit to government rule because it went against God's law. I'll give you just a few examples. Um, the midwives did not obey Pharaoh's command to kill the children because it went against what was right. Um, Rahab denied the king of Jericho that men from Israel were coming to her house. She hid them, even though the king asked her. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego did not bow to Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. Daniel continued to pray after it was signed in the law of the Medes and the Persians that you could not pray. The apostles said we ought to obey God rather than men when they were told by the Jewish officials who had a lot of control under Judaism, under the government in, in Jerusalem, when they were told not to preach in the name of Jesus. They said we ought to obey God rather than men. If the government makes a law that contradicts God's commandment, then you follow God's commandment. But make sure you're following God's commandment and not your own ego and your own pride and your own stubbornness. As it said in Peter, don't use this freedom that we have to cover for evil, to justify disobedience to the government. And here in the United States, really, we have, you know, we got a pretty good, we got it pretty good here. All right? So anyway, there's a little bit about that. Also in the scripture, in these things, there's nothing about party affiliation. You know, God didn't say the Republicans or, you know, the Democrats. They got, you know, he didn't, there's nothing about that. There's nothing about politics in these verses. It's general. There's also nothing in these verses about whether you should vote or not. Some people don't think you should be involved at all and don't vote. And others say, oh, you better vote. If you're a Christian, that doesn't say this, right? Don't put things that aren't in the Bible. And also, it doesn't say whether you can be involved in politics or not or run for office. I mean, there are political people in the book of Acts, right? The, the jailer, right? The jailer, well, he was a political person, and he got converted in his household. Um, there's other people within that were witness to that, you know, they weren't told to leave office. So, you know, the idea that you can't be involved, it doesn't say these things. Don't, don't add or subtract from what it says. Just obey the government. Be subject to authorities and follow Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line. Now, next verse, 13, 5 and 6. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes for rulers or servants of God devoting themselves to this very thing. Pay your taxes. Pay taxes. Um, you know what I think about this? Be wise. Learn, learn the rules. Again, here's another frustrating, this is another frustrating thing for me, who has always my entire life endeavored to pay taxes. Stop! Changing the rules, right? It just, you know, one other party, like, you know, if, if another party gets in tr control after tonight, all the things that you've tried to figure out with your deductions so that you come out even, so you're not paying, it's all going to change, all right? And yes, it's frustrating. And yes, I'm like, I hate when I have to pay. I hate when I don't, you know, but anyways, you know, they change the rules, and so it's okay. So what? Pay your taxes. And learn. And I think we should be wise. You should learn. You should learn. 
you know, what's taxed. You should learn what's deductible. Learn, learn what you're allowed to do. That's, that's being wise. You know, we should be wise as serpents. We should learn how to um, live with the mammon, right? You know, we should be wise with those things that we've been bestowed upon. We should be faithful in that which is least and understand the tax rules. You know, it was really crazy when I, when I, uh, my son Blake was, we were going around to theaters and we were selling at these different, uh, you know, uh, sales tax laws. Oh my gosh. Sales, forget sales tax laws. We were selling all these different counties. Do you know every county is different? Every county, what you get it charged for tax is different than a different county. So if we had a sales and we only sold, you know, we only sold a few things, but we had to justify, we had to go to every single county that we sold and do the tax rules. And then, oh, and then clothing, clothing's not taxed. So we were selling T-shirts, so those don't get taxed. We were selling DVDs, those do get taxed. It's just like, <laughs> anyways, that's another thing for another day. But learn the rules and be wise. We should be the most, we should be the most wise in this. But Jesus had some dealings with taxes, and I, I'll just put these up here. You're probably familiar with these. Matthew 21, 15 through 22 on the chart. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent his, their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Herodians were those people who were loyal to Herod. They were very loyal to the Roman government. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know what you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one. For you are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their malice. And he said, why are you testing me? You hypocrites. Show me the coin. Let me see that coin. Okay. Let me see. Who's, who's, who's on it? George Washington. No, I mean, who's on that coin? He said, who's on the coin? And he said, Caesar's. They said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. In hearing this, they were amazed, and leaving him, they went away. <laughs> you know, pay to God what's God, pay to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. In different countries, I mean, some countries tax a lot, some states tax a lot. Hello, New York. You know, and some states don't tax as much, right? It's just, it's, it's crazy. And uh, so you learn, you learn to live with it, and you, and you just move on. It's not that big a deal, really. Right? It really isn't. If you learn it and you in your budget, I love this one in Matthew 17. And again, in the chart up here, uh, verse 24. They came to Capernaum. Those who collected the two drachma came next. Came to Peter and said, "Does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? Does he not pay the two drachma?" He said, "Yes." And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, "What do you think, Simon?" From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? Do they get it from their own children or do they get it from strangers? And Peter said, from strangers. And Jesus said to him, then sons are exempt. However, so that we don't offend them, go to the sea, throw in a hook, take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you'll find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me. <laughs> I love this. At tax, tax day, go fishing. <laughs> That's what I get out of this. Go fishing. Yeah, I like that. Um, <laughs> no, you know, what I th you know what that says to me? God is our sufficiency, not the government. God supplies all of our needs. And we are told to be faithful to that which is least. We are told to be uh, uh, under authority, be subject to governing authorities, pay the taxes that are due, and live higher than this life. And as we do good, and as we live as examples, your life is a witness. Your life shines. And we can be glorious. And so, um, so that's a little bit about Romans 13.